Hey guys, welcome back to another episode of Chronically Healing with Jesse Fritz and Christina Sangera. Hey. Hey, hey. So we are super excited to bring you this interview with Renee Nicholson. We really think you're going to enjoy everything she had to say. Jesse and myself were both thoroughly impressed with her stance on all things chronic illness, life. We dive into a really cool topic that I found myself wanting to learn even more about called narrative medicine, the power of writing. We talk about your identity and how you can shift from a place of symptom chasing to reestablishing your identity and who you want to be in the world despite your chronic illness. So it's just a really good episode if you are wanting to get to a better place mindset wise and maybe even discover some new creative outlets for your chronic illness and how to manage, live with it and still live a vibrant life. I don't know. What, what did you think, Jesse? Yeah, I totally agree. I loved talking to Renee. And as I say in the episode, I have a, a deep connection with writing and it's helped me throughout my life, chronic illness or not. And I think that a lot of these topics that we talked about with her can be just so helpful to everybody across the board, whether, like you said, whether it is trying to find your way, I think even if we are someone who's had chronic illness for a really long time, you still have these ups and downs. I definitely know that I'm going through one of those periods for me. So I think that this episode is just so great. And Renee is so sweet and I loved getting to know her. She inspired me. This is so exciting because we get to talk to people that we genuinely Mm -hmm. also want to understand their stories and what they're going through. And we get new ideas for our own journey, which I love. Mm -hmm. The medicine again really stuck out to me. So, and I'm going to hold you accountable. Mm -hmm. You said you're going to pull that Google doc up with your (laughs) writing. So I'll be making sure you do that because I really do love your writing style. Yeah. I want you to do more writing. (laughs) I know I need to do it. And plus like there are too many signs with Renee. She has a golden retriever. She like lives just a couple states from me. She just started a CSA box, which I just started a CSA box. So there's just a few too many, um, with a few too many signs there for me that maybe I should be listening to this. <laughs> I feel like the universe, when you don't listen, it'll tap you on the shoulder a little <laughs> And then eventually it's going to like knock into you. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I don't know if this has ever happened to you, but I've had times where I've like had an idea or something that I wanted to do. And then I just kept putting it off and I never did it. And then someone else does it. Like I, I hear about somebody else that did something that is very similar to my initial idea. And I'm like, shit, I should have done that. So, so yeah, I think that those signs, that's where the universe is like, if you don't take this idea, I'm going to give it to somebody else. Yeah. So I, I think that this is such a wonderful episode. I really, I really do. And I can't wait for everyone to hear it. Yes. And make sure that you guys leave a review if you haven't yet for the podcast and make sure you subscribe to chronically healing. You can subscribe on pretty much every podcast network. It should be there. If it's not, let me know and I will get it there, but make sure you subscribe and leaving a review really helps us grow. And it continues to help the podcast kind of move up in those ranks. So people around the world will see it pop up in their, in their screen. But, but yeah, we're so excited for y'all to listen in today. I have a quick shout out too for our Facebook group. We'll link Mm. that in the show notes. And then our newly launched Instagram, Chronic Healing Podcast. So just search for that on Instagram, you'll find us. And then our private group, we're going to revive that and be doing a lot of fun stuff in there. So definitely make sure you check that out too. Yeah, make sure you guys join in with Christina on the team here. We have so many new ideas coming up and and it's not just me, it's me or both of us. So we're able to kind of, really give you a well-rounded community and we're really excited for it. But, but yeah, make sure you listen in to Renee's episode and I hope y'all are having a wonderful day. See you soon. Hi everyone. Welcome back to the chronically healing podcast. Welcome to season two, officially season two with my new co-host, Christina Sangara. We're so excited to have you guys here again, but we are starting off the new season today with Renee Nicholson. I'm really excited to chat with you today and hear more about your story, but is, so I don't get started and start rambling right away. Why don't you give us a little introduction about you and then we will dive into your chronic illness and then we'll go, um, through the rest of your story as well. Sure. And thank you for having me. Uh, I really appreciate uh, being here at the beginning of season two. <laughs> um, that's always exciting. Um, so uh, I 
am a writer, uh, but I was not always a writer. Uh, I was, uh, as a young person, uh, trained uh, in uh, classical ballet mm -hmm. and uh, went through uh, pretty rigorous pre-professional and professional training uh, and started dancing and, um, you know, just started to hit a little bit of a stride and then was uh, precluded from that when I was diagnosed with rheumatoid arthritis. And um, so that was uh, definitely a moment of change in, in my life for sure. Um, and later uh, found creative writing in college and uh, never lost my love of the art form. And so found myself later writing a lot about dance and um, recently published a book uh, about my experiences both in dance and with illness. Mm -hmm. So I guess that, that's probably a good short uh, bio. I, I'm also a, a, a professor at uh, West Virginia University. Uh, I teach in uh, our programs in multi and interdisciplinary studies. And I, I typically teach writing classes and classes um, around uh, medicine and illness. I have a class that I've taught for the Honors College here uh, called Medicine in the Arts. Mm -hmm. And uh, I currently direct WVU's uh, Humanity Center. Mm. I love that. The the arts just has such a special place in my heart. I was never a dancer, but just the arts in general, music, all of that kind of stuff. And I know being in ballet is like very rigorous. Like it's something you have been doing since you were young, right? Yes, it really, uh, right around age seven is when I started the serious training. Um, I'd had a few dance classes, you know, community kind of uh, mommy and me kind of dance things before that, but age seven is when the, the you know, serious ballet training really started. And, you know, by, by the time I was 10, I was going every day. That's all I wanted to do is, mm -hmm. is, uh, I'd get home from school and I'd, and my mom would pick me up and you know, I'd be putting my hair up in the car and <laughs> there I was. Yep. I feel like one thing that sticks out when it comes to ballet, because I do think of it as being so rigorous, is it really parallels with chronic illness in that you have to really be dedicated to the journey and you have to have a lot of grit. Mm -hmm. I've no navigate chronic illness and navigate being, I, I want to, I think we should dive into that at some point, because I feel like that parallel is such a strong correlation from ballet to chronic illness and maybe being a ballet dancer, is that the right terminology? Ballet? Yeah, yeah it is. I feel like that could totally parallel into how you navigate chronic illness and more so how you're able to get back up every time mm -hmm. you have to fall back, you know? You know, Christina, I hadn't thought about it until you asked that question, and it's a really great one because there really is a parallel. The self-discipline that I learned as a dancer is the same thing I've applied to being a rheumatoid arthritis patient and understanding routine and taking care of your body, listening to your body, and, and kind of sticking with the program. You're, you're in, you're always getting input from others. As a dancer, it's your teachers and coaches, your directors. And as a patient, it's your healthcare providers. Um, but there uh, is definitely a kind of getting, getting into a routine to keep yourself at peak performance. And as a dancer, that's through the technique. But as a patient, that's really around how can I live the healthiest life that I can how can I be well, even as uh, aspects of my health need tending to? And all of that takes that, and that, uh, you know, that kind of grit, resilience, and self-discipline that probably f I could, if I trace back its foundation, can be traced right back to that dance training, <laughs> for sure. <laughs> Yeah, I could, I could totally see that. And so just to bring it back for a second, for those that might not know what rheumatoid arthritis is, if you can explain that, and then maybe just explain a little bit into your journey of, of how that impacted you and how you found out that, that you had that. Sure. So rheumatoid arthritis is an autoimmune condition, and that's where your immune system uh, is 
out of balance and attacks its own healthy tissue. And in the case of rheumatoid arthritis, it, it attacks your healthy joint tissue. Um, so when we think of arthritis, we typically think of osteoarthritis, which is the sort of natural degradation of the joint over time. Um, and we think of older people. And with rheumatoid arthritis, you have some of those same kind of symptoms, but it's because of uh, the autoimmune process of, of attacking your healthy joints. It's kind of spooky <laughs> because it doesn't have any out, you know, really outward symptoms until, you know, you start seeing your joints swell and you, and you have like a, a warmth feeling, like a hot feeling and, and accompanied by pain and stiffness. So those are kind of the telltale symptoms of, of rheumatoid arthritis. For me, it was hard to to tell what was happening to me because as a dancer, you're used to your body being put through its paces a lot and you deal right. with kind of knackering things all the time. For me, what was happening is my joints were, you know, really visibly swelling. Um, and there's, there was one time where I noticed my, my knees were swollen and it looked like if you had taken, had taken a grapefruit and, and halved it, and then slipped it underneath my patella. That's what my knee looked like. I mean, it was wow. just really, really swollen. So I had worked with some physicians, but because I was a doctor, they were thinking overuse and other things like that. And one night I was just miserable. And so a friend drove me to the ER and the ER doctor had worked with some other uh, autoimmune patients, mostly lupus patients, but lupus is a very similar kind of condition. And he said, I'm going to write you, um, uh, you know, I'm going to get you in to uh, see a rheumatologist because I think this might be something different than, than just the dancing alone. And so then it's a blood test, right? <laughs> it's a yeah. very different, it's not just all right, overuse, rest, let it heal kind of thing. So that was a very, like, that was like a moment where I was like, something else is going on. And it was fast. A lot of um, autoimmune, you're just predisposed to these conditions. And so you, you don't necessarily get warning signs ahead of time. Like you, you can sometimes know with, with injuries with dance, you've been pushing hard, you're, you know, or you can feel the overuse, that sort of thing. And those weren't really present when I was starting to have these symptoms. I mean, yes, I was working hard, but no, no more on my body than I was used to. So that kind of made it a little trickier, but when these things started to manifest, it didn't take long for me to, to go in and, and the blood test revealed what's called a rheumatoid factor, which is one of the ways that they diagnose rheumatoid arthritis. And so then it's a whole change. Like a professional dance career <laughs> is no longer an option when you right. have rheumatoid arthritis. And so the first thing I did <laughs> when I was, you know, when I realized okay, I had to have a whole different life is, is I cut off all my hair. <laughs> I had <laughs> long hair, um, as many dancers do. And I cut it into this like cute little bob. <laughs> and I just, I had to not look like mm -hmm. a dancer so I could start thinking of myself as something else. Mm -hmm. And uh, I started taking all sorts of courses, um, college courses, and everything from psychology, and physics, and uh, history courses. And I took an introduction to creative writing course. And uh, I, I was enjoying it and wrote, wrote my first short story and turned it in and I got it back. And there was a little note at the top from the instructor, come and see me in my office hours. And I'm like, oh, this isn't going to be the right path for me, darn. So I go to and then she's going to tell me to drop the class or something. I, I don't know what I was thinking, but I, so I, I go to see her on her office hours and she's talking to me about the story and she's telling me things she liked and she's giving me suggestions. And then um, the instructor says to me, well, did you like writing this? And I said, I did. And she's like, well, what's your major? And I'm like, I'm kind of floating around. <laughs> you know, I don't really have direction. She's like, well, would you like this to be? your major. And I'm like, can this be my major? And then she's like handing me an application because they have a, a scholarship. <laughs> and from there, things kind of took off. So in that way, I was 
extremely fortunate. Um, I'm very lucky. But that came into my life at, it, at the time that it did. But it really kind of took like physically changing my appearance in some way to really just get my head around, all right, this is, things are going to proceed differently from here. Yeah, I get asked a lot, weren't you devastated? And I think I was, but I think that if I was so in shock about what was happening that I was just kind of looking for, all right, what can I do? Right. And, and I was so focused on that. And I, I feel like the grief has been maybe a longer term thing. Like the more that I was doing other things, the more I was letting go of, of the dancing. And so it wasn't like this, oh my gosh, this momentous break, but this almost like a scramble, like, what am I going to do next? (laughs) And how am I going to be, right? Because I'd only ever thought of myself as being a dancer. (laughs) And so now I'm like, okay, how do I just be? And so uh, cutting my hair was definitely, that was one of those. And I kept it for, for, for many years. And then around the time I started writing about dancing, which I didn't at first, I mean, it was just too much at first. So I wrote about other things. And then I started writing about dancing and I grew my hair out and I've kept it long ever since. <laughs> so I don't know, you know, there's always things that, that, that people say about their hair, especially women, you know, mm-hmm. oh, you cut your hair, you change your life. And I'm like, no, my life changed when I cut my hair. <laughs> I love your approach to, so I just want to, my hubby, he's had four knee surgeries Ooh. and he almost had to get a fifth. And the doctor basically said, you can't jump and you can't mm-hmm. run. And he's mm-hmm. been an athlete his whole life. And the first thing I thought was, well, let's focus on what you can do. So I love that you you mentioned that because I feel like a lot of our listeners as well who have chronic illness, there's like this death of their identity that happens mm-hmm. when yeah. they're diagnosed. I remember that that feeling when I finally got the diagnosis, I know Jesse and I have talked about this a lot on our own time and just feeling validated, but also like there's this death and then a rebirth that happens after diagnosis and who are we now and how do we navigate the world now that we know what's happening? And it's almost weird. You can have the symptoms, but until you know what's going on, there's like a bigger weight to it now that there's a title, if you will, like a, like a tag on it. So I love that you focused on what you could do and you started focusing on what you wanted to bring into your life. That's wonderful. I feel like that's such a good coping mechanism that, you know, I myself did not employ (laughs) until later. I think I wallowed for a little bit longer than you did. (laughs) I think my wallowing came differently. It was like in small increments over time. Um, But, uh, you know, I think it's completely consistent with my personality to switch to, all right, I can't do this. Well, what can I do? And that can give you a lot of validation thinking about all the things that you can do because it's easy to think i mean you go in and you get diagnosed and all of a sudden these are these are all the things you must do right so Mm -hmm. here are the therapies here are the things we're gonna and then here are all the things you can no longer do right and in the case of your husband like the no running and jumping I, I, I totally, I, I feel for <laughs> for him because I understand that very, very uh, uh, personally. And I think what happens then is there is that, that, that death of identity, right? And it, you're almost tasked with crafting a new one because you can, you, you now have the identity of patient, but that's just one piece of a bigger whole that is a person, right? You can't just be a patient, right? Um, It's not the only identity marker that we have. And so I I think understanding that there's still lots of life ahead of you, that it's multifaceted, that you already were many things. I mean, yes, I was a dancer, but I was also a sister, a daughter, a student, um, I should have known that writing was going to be something that I liked because I was always a voracious reader. <laughs> so if I wasn't in the ballet studio, there was a very good chance my nose was in a book. <laughs> so I think that when you're dealing with an illness, realizing, well, yes, that is a part of who you are. And it's one part of, of a much more multifaceted whole mm-hmm. Um and embracing those other parts as well, because it's really easy to get focused on just the one thing. Yeah, I think not letting it consume you. I know that I, even now, still struggle with that, where sure. I can be 
periods of symptom chasing, I call it. So it's like I wake up and I am waiting. Okay, body, what you got right. for me today? <laughs> I go through the day and every little thing that happens, I'm like, see, <laughs> so I think that it's really easy to get stuck in that identity. And I think for me, the best days that I have are actually the ones where I'm not tethered to that identity. I'm not symptom chasing. In fact, I'm almost not even really on that wavelength at all. So I love that you've reached that point. That's wonderful. Thanks. And, and symptom chasing is a great way to put it one of the symptoms of rheumatoid arthritis is fatigue, right? Um, but sometimes my job is just fatiguing. And sometimes I've just been up late, at, you know, reading or doing something else. And then of course, with COVID, fatigue is ill. I'm like, it, do I have RA? Do I have allergies? Do I have COVID? <laughs> you know? And it's easy to get into that what if, what if, what if. Uh, and symptom changing is a perfect way to put it. Because it is almost a, a foot race against something you can't even really see until you, you, you let it be still a moment and you embrace those other parts of your life. And then you kind of know, um, and then you can work with your health providers or whomever else. But it's hard. I think it's hard not to send some chase. <laughs> <laughs> I think having chronic illness puts us in a hypervigilant state that we have to work actively to get away from. It's like we're not in control of that necessarily. We ha we have to actually do the work very consciously to not be part of that. And Jesse, I feel like you'll relate to this. There was a moment, there was a, a part of my life where I felt like everything was a flare. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Everything's a flare. <laughs> right. Are you sun just tired. Mm -hmm. So you have allergies because I'm basically allergic to life, right? <laughs> I think that there's sure. that feeling of, you know, detaching from not everything is a flare. Sometimes I don't, well, I don't want to curse, but sometimes I feel like the body is just being a little biatch, okay. you know? <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, I feel that a hundred percent. It's just, it's funny because you, the, the body doesn't, doesn't always allow you to be in control, right? Mm -hmm. And I was, you were saying that I, I've thought about so many times in our life, we're looking for those, like all the factors we can control, all that sense of security that we all want. And when you're dealing with a chronic illness, you're kind of running parallel to something that is more chaotic and, you know, chaos resists control, mm. right? And so how do you find the, the equilibrium? And in a weird way, that makes me think about uh, dancing. So when you learn to balance on point, you know, on basically on the tips of your toes, as you, you really press down to raise your body up, right? So it's, it's almost this, this opposite forces working in order to find and sustain that balance, right? And if I think about that in terms of controlling chaos, right, it's almost that same kind of push and pull. And the truth is, is even people who aren't living with chronic illness are searching for balance. I mean, I, I feel like any day of the week, I might run across an article about how people are burnt out from their jobs or they're trying to balance all the, you know, uh, caregiving for children and aging parents. I mean, there's all sorts of things that we're looking for that precarious balance. And I think it's always tempting to think of it as, as going trying to reach for something but it then I think about like how do you balance on point well it's the pressing down to lift yourself up mm -hmm. and that that kind of opposite forces so I, I don't know maybe we can harness that in a way that that's helpful at least I hope so <laughs> yeah me too <laughs> um, <laughs> one of the reasons I was I mean I was excited to talk to you in general but you're writing has always been something that's been very dear to my heart. I have, I was a writer when I was little. I remember I used to write songs and poems and like short stories. None of them made any sense, but I loved to do in it. And I, I've always loved writing. I wanted to go to college for English, but then, you know, the whole, you're not going to get a job with that kind of threw me off. So I went to, for communications, which basically is similar enough. So writing for me has always been really healing. And then I kind of backed away from it just because I was doing it so much in my job that I just 
I wasn't interested in writing anymore, even creatively. And I've noticed since I left my job last year and I've been working in kind of for myself and I've had a little bit more space to do some more creative work that I've been having these urges to write again, to write creatively. And, and the few times that I've actually let myself do it, I've just felt so good. So Anyway, I was very excited to talk to you about that too, because writing being medicine, and I know you like the term narrative medicine, I'm really interested to to hear what what that is. But I think that sometimes we look at medicine as like this pill I take or this supplement or this whatever other biohacking I'm doing, but something like writing, even journaling or something for people can be really healing. So can you explain what narrative medicine is? And then, yeah, go into that a little bit. Absolutely. And there's nothing better, by the way, than hearing somebody saying that they're doing their, they're, they're tapping back into their creativity again, whether that's writing or something else. I mean, writing is one of the ones I know and is dear to me, but it's just, that is, fantastic. So I'm glad that it's coming back to you. <laughs> Thank you. Um, but, but to your point about narrative medicine, so this is a practice um, that was actually developed by this incredible woman at Columbia University. And her name is Dr. Rita Sharon. And she is a general internist. So she's a medical doctor. And uh, she always loved literature. And so she pursued while uh, working her practice, she pursued a PhD in literature. She's a Henry James scholar uh, by trade on that side of things. And what she realized is the things that she was working on um, in her PhD program were having um, overlap with the things she was doing in her clinic. And so she started writing about this and she has this wonderful quote and she says, the care of the sick unfolds in stories. Mm. And I just love that because it speaks to, I think, what the heart of what narrative medicine is. And the idea that um, that uh, that the practice of medicine and and, you know, being a patient in that practice of medicine, that that can be fortified by narrative competence, right? That when we understand stories, we understand ourselves better. Uh, if you're a physician, you understand your patient better. Um, you know, they, uh, the practice has been applied to physician burnout. So um, if we're, we're caring for all these other people, we're going to be better at our jobs if we care for ourselves. Um, those kinds of things. And I was sort of practicing narrative medicine before I even knew what it was. I was actually approached by a palliative care physician um, some years ago now, I I guess around 2015. um, And he had a patient um, who uh, had ALS and um, he wanted to write a memoir before he died. And at the time that they found me, this this patient, his name was Jamie, um, was wheelchair bound. Uh, he had a mechanized wheelchair that he could um, sort of maneuver with a joystick that he used his chin to move around because he couldn't wow. lift his arms. He couldn't actually use a pen <laughs> to write. Wow. And so he, he wanted to write a memoir. And so this doctor had uh, you know, been asking around, can somebody help him? And I said, and he, through a friend of a friend, got connected with me. And I said, all right, I don't know if I can help him, but I really want to meet him mm-hmm. and I'll try, right? Yeah. So I started working with Jamie and I started, he has lived this amazing life. And so we started getting these stories down. And then I was like, okay, I can't be the only person that this has ever happened to. So then I started Googling, you know, like everybody else, I don't know what I'm doing. I'll Google it. (laughs) Writing with patients, writing with ALS, writing, and it kept coming back to um, Columbia's program in narrative medicine. So I'm like, okay, they have a workshop coming up. I'm going to go because clearly I need some help to understand what this is. And I just really felt like it was a long weekend workshop. And when I was there, I was like, oh my gosh, I'm, I'm with my people. And I was in a group with physicians, nurses, chaplain, other patients, writers. I mean, just a real collection that all had that kind of shared purpose. And I think that writing helps us discover things about ourselves. And when you're a patient, that's so powerful because it can help 
you with that identity piece, right? That's so hard to reimagine just in workaday life, right? But when you're on the page and whether it's writing for publication or if it's writing in a journal or if it's writing for whatever reason at all, I think that those can be seen as as journeys of discovery. And what's better when you're um, in the position of dealing with illness than understanding yourself better. So I realized that a lot of my own writing was in fact narrative medicine, (laughs) that I was honoring the person I had been and rediscovering the person I was becoming um, through my, through my writing. And then I had these opportunities. So I I worked with, with Jamie and we finished his memoir before he died. And Jamie happened to be the Dean Emeritus uh, of medical education at WVU medicine. Mm. And all of a sudden, I was sort of thrown into the orbit of all these doctors at my own institution. (laughs) And so I started working with other patient groups. I've worked with um, cancer patients in the chemotherapy infusion center. I've worked with HIV patients. I've worked with other ALS patients. And there's nothing like working with people to hear their stories. Like, I, I feel like that's the gift that that they give me even though it's really the story for them Mm -hmm. (laughs) because I've I've met just incredible people and ordinary lives are so beautiful Mm -hmm. that's the thing that I think narrative medicine has taught me the most is like just the beauty of people Um, and and for me that was mostly people around the state of West Virginia so which is where my family is originally from so I I felt a very deep connection there. Renee I just want to re-highlight what you wrote because that really stuck out to me so writing helps us discover things about ourselves but then also it honors the person you were while discovering the person you are becoming. Mm -hmm. I love that. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> Thank you, Christina. <laughs> yeah, I, yeah. So I, I journal, right? So I, I journal in the morning. So to me, this is a deeper level of journaling, if you will. Mm-hmm. And yeah. I'll I'll journal and I'll find certain things from that session that just kind of feel like a light bulb moment. So I just, I love this. This is a really interesting strategy to navigate in chronic illness. And ALS is, if if I'm not mistaken, ALS is essentially debilitating we know that and then it it usually leads to an early an early death right yes yeah um yeah the the most famous person with that had als was stephen hawking um right so a lot of people and and a lot of people knew um know about it because of the ice bucket challenge yeah (laughs) um god yeah but it's it's a very debilitating disease and and you but basically your muscles just stop functioning, right? And it's neurological from my understanding. I mean, what I know about ALS is is tiny amount, but some of the patients that I've I've worked with with ALS, they're some of the most resilient people. And the interesting thing with working with Jamie is he was this, this very professional person with a very rich life. He was, you know, an outdoorsman, uh, really loved uh, kayaking and canoeing. He and his wife canoed through the Colorado River, um, right through the Grand Canyon. (laughs) I mean, just amazing kind of things like that. And when we started working on um, his memoir, he was thinking about the book, even when I wasn't there. And one day he said, this is my work now. And that like gave him a whole other sense of purpose. And and so I would say, Christina, that journaling that you're doing, that's part of your work, right? As somebody dealing with chronic illness and being a human alive in the world, discovering and growing is part of what we are at an essential level. So I, I think that's wonderful. It sounds like you're both writing. So that's, that's always heartening too. <laughs> came up with the name of this podcast just on a whim she's that who comes up with awesome names without even having to put any effort whatsoever so i want to see more from you jesse okay after this episode well, okay. i had I, a, do. I, I had a dream like i don't know almost a year ago now and i woke up and something in my body was like 
I have to write, like, this is like the start of a story. Cause I've always liked fiction, like very fiction. I think like Lord of the Rings, like that, like very, very fiction. <laughs> and this is kind of what that dream was for me. And so I've started actually writing it, but I get in my head a lot. So a lot of it for me is like, I'm like, oh, like I need to be doing client work. I need to be doing this. But yeah, it's something that I've always loved. And I used to write all the time. And, and two, like what you're saying, it can, for anybody that's listening, that's not a writer. And I know there's a lot of people out there that like hate journaling too. It, it doesn't, you don't have to be a good writer to write. Like it can just be writing things down, writing a gratitude list in the morning. If you're having a really hard time, just writing it down on a piece of paper and burning it. If you want to, it, you know, it doesn't have to be this, like you're turning into the next JK Rowling or something like that, but it can be really healing just to get those thoughts moving and out. Like, I just think about like this stagnant feeling in you. And this is a way that you can like move it and get it out, which is how writing has always been for me is just like, I need to get this out <laughs> without like, you know, always going to my husband and screaming at him. Like I need to get this out in, in a better way. We'll see. Sure. And Renee, we, earlier you said that life, so basically or, ordinary moments are beautiful. That reminds mm -hmm. me of that, Jesse, when you said that, because I, I always try to root down into the clouds and having a moment with my kid without my phone and putting my feet on the ground or the sun. So when you said that, that really stuck out to me because I think that in our rush to kind of get through life and get to some elusive summit, mm -hmm. we lose sight of those things mm -hmm. that we could be writing on that piece of paper, which we might burn and that's cool too, right? But what are those things that really are in, in and of themselves many miracles that we just stop thinking about? This is going to sound kind of weird, but even this morning I was looking at the sky. You guys ever look at the sky? And the yeah. yeah. Or there's like a <laughs> sunset that's just... Oh my gosh, right? And how often do we just kind of walk through that? Meh, cool. And when you really stop to think about it, it's really freaking awesome. And if we root it down into that moment, it's it can inspire some awe if you're if you're feeling it. So I think that's really awesome too that you highlighted that you know the ordinary moments matter. And Brene Brown talks about that in her book. I can't remember which one, maybe it was Daring Greatly, but there was a couple who lost their son, their young son, and one of the things they missed most was the sound of the screen door hitting mm. the door frame whenever he would come in and it was just that ordinary moment it wasn't it was just that that thing that they remembered the most and so i think that it's that's another way that this um this writing practice could really help people to rediscover those ordinary moments and to feel more hope every single day versus waiting for some big moment mm. absolutely and you know for people who you know, writing doesn't come, you know, as easily. I mean, the, the beautiful thing about our phones is that they all have cameras. Mm -hmm. um, and there's lots of people who use photos as a way of storytelling, of capturing things. Um, and I would say, you know, that that can be somebody's journal, mm -hmm. right? Um, if that's kind of how they're programmed is to interact with the world, if it's a much more visual I've known lots of people who are uh, who like to draw. I mean, I think doodling can be also extremely therapeutic in a lot of ways, but and a, and a way of storytelling also. So there, you know, there are lots of ways in. <laughs> but yeah, and um, this the story with the sound of the door. Some of those things that that we associate that aren't purely visual, right? Sounds, smells, for sure, the, the texture of things. You know, one of the things that makes me remember uh, my time as a dancer are scratchy fabrics, uh, <laughs> because tall from a, uh, from a tutu is extremely scratchy. <laughs> and the bodices, you know, the boning, it's like, a, you know, some, you know, corsetting, really. <laughs> and you know, you're really like kind of... Uh, hemmed in there <laughs> so sometimes it's those those other sort of tactile and, and sensory things that can bring us into the moment so one question that i wanted to ask you too was to talk a little bit about the book that you wrote if you can give us a little info on that sure yes so i jesse you said you love fiction i originally thought i was going to be a fiction writer and I was going to write about uh, dancing, but it wasn't going to be about me. 
Mm-hmm. And it was really funny because I was, I was in workshops and I was writing about dancers that had totally different characteristics than me from a dance perspective. And I kept getting kind of feedback. Well, this is clearly you. <laughs> and I always found that kind of ironic. But for, for a long time, I didn't feel comfortable telling my own story. And then I took a creative nonfiction class and I wrote an essay about training as a dancer and really kind of got you know my hands dirty with it um, and revealed some things that were tough about it and some things about myself that I wanted to have friends, but all of my friends were also my competitors. And how did I, was I going to manage that? And so that was really the first inkling that maybe I should be writing nonfiction. And um, that the personal essay was really a form that I felt really at home. Mm -hmm. And when I think about, when I think about stories and I think about my life, I think about them almost in those discrete essay forms. Everyone's like, you should write a memoir. And I'm like, I don't know if a memoir, you know, starting at point A and going to point B was what I wanted to do, but I kept writing essays about what I'd been through and what I was going through. So it really evolved over time. I started the book, I started writing the book in uh, 20, let's see, 2006, in in, uh, uh, early 2006 with that first essay. I didn't realize I was starting a book at that time, but that's when I wrote that first essay. And then I stuck with it and probably finished the last essay, I want to say around 2016, 2017. Um, so spent a lot of time with, with these. And book really, you know, I, it gives you almost discrete snapshots. Almost I like to think of them like Polaroid pictures, right? Where you take the picture and it sort of develops for you. <laughs> and at different points, as a dancer, what it was like to be a dancer. And then, um, and the book's in two parts and it's the, you know, the dancing self part and then the after dancing part in which I find dancing again. So um, in uh, 2009, uh, I was 36 years old. I was a year out of a graduate program in creative writing and I um, needed to have knee replacement surgery. There was just no way around it. Mm-hmm. And so that was another kind of pivotal moment in, in writing for me because I had a lot of downtime, <laughs> you know, where I was just letting the surgery heal. And then, you know, I would be going to physical therapy and in physical therapy, I, I totally, again, the dancer's mentality came back and I had this wonderful physical therapist who, who found out I was a dancer and put me on a Pilates reformer. And I had done Pilates a ton as a dancer and the muscle memory just started to come back. Mm-hmm. And I realized I was never going to be a dancer like I was, but I was going to be able to have some level of dance in my life. And that was really satisfying. At the same time, I was starting to publish these essays and the director of dance um, at WVU at the time uh, had asked me to come and coach some uh, advanced ballet dancers. Could I, could I work with them? She was a modern dancer, a beautiful choreographer. So I found myself um, being asked to teach. So all of a sudden I could do a little more and I was kind of back in the studio so I was going to celebrate my sort of return after surgery by putting myself through this really intensive teacher training at American <laughs> Ballet Theater in New York City, because if you're going to do it, why do it halfway? <laughs> so I started writing about that and I started writing about uh, teaching uh, these other dancers and that became not the whole part of the second part of the book, but uh, one of the major themes, because I found that I absolutely loved passing on what I knew about dancing um, to these young dancers. And not all of them, most of them, in fact, would not go on and dance. And that I realized that wasn't the point of teaching, of teaching dancing, Mm -hmm. um, that it was understanding the beauty of movement, understanding the, just the, the beauty of the art form, to understand yourself better through those things. And, and I watched these young women mostly. I mean, there were, I, I trained a, a few uh, male dancers, but mostly young women. 
And then I wrote one of the, I guess, sort of one of the centerpiece essays, one of the longer essays was about going to New York City and feeling both somebody in their mid thirties and like a 16 year old again in New York City in the dance studio. So the book kind of uh, connects in that way as well. I also had a really interesting, uh, again, chance encounter There was a man who lived in Morgantown, and I knew him, again, close to the end of his life. And uh, he was 90 years old when I met him. And he had called the College of Creative Arts and was looking for someone to help catalog an extensive collection of ballet memorabilia for the Performing Arts Library in New York. So I was uh, asked if I could take a student out and see what this was all about. So I walk into Peter Franklin White's uh, house, which was up, literally up the hill from me <laughs> in the little neighborhood I live in, Morgantown. And there's a picture, and it has two extremely famous dancers, and then him. Uh, but I would, you know, recognize these da- these dancers, Margot Fontaine and uh, Rudolf Nureyev. And he was one of the founding members of the Royal Ballet of England. And he lived at the hall for me in Morgantown. And nobody taught me more about being a former dancer than Peter did. He was such a, he was such a cool guy and shared so much of his life with me. And the things that he had in this little house here in Morgantown, and he was going back and forth between New York City and Illinois, like Chicago area, and also the University of Illinois. And Morgantown was an affordable place between the two. And that's why he had bought a house there. (laughs) And nobody knew that this luminary was living here in Morgantown. And so that that was also something I I got to write about in the book, or these new relationships that I had that connected with, with dancing. Um, but that weren't competitive and they were through other aspects of the art form. The book does have, it has a lot to do with dancing. It has, you know, I talk, I I write also quite a bit about the arthritis journey and what it was like getting knee replacement surgery and the cavalcade of different things that I've tried over the years and therapies I've been on and those kinds of things. So I guess it's a little bit of everything is as far as the two subjects. I like the essay form. Mm. That is to me really digestible. I feel like some Uh, memoirs can feel very lengthy or I don't know. It just feels like an essay is nice because it's little bits and pieces, little stories that I can return to. So I like that you wrote it in essay form. That's that's appealing to me. I think I like to write that way. I mean, mm-hmm. um, it does kind of feel like here's the Polaroid of this. <laughs> yeah, and you can you can just kind of ret- return to that moment. Mm-hmm. So are you still in West Virginia now? Is that where you are? Yeah, yeah. I I'm still in in Morgantown, and I'm still in West Virginia. Um, which right now is uh, a precarious place to be COVID wise, but uh, (laughs) luckily right here uh, near our med center uh, and we've got some fantastic folks there. So, um, but I think like every, like every place we're all trying to grapple with what's going on. Mm -hmm. Um, But I love West Virginia is naturally just a very beautiful place. Um, I have a lot of family here, so not a bad place for me to land and, uh, I work at the university and, and that's a, a vibrant place to be too. Yeah. That I, I, uh, we moved to North Carolina just over a year ago, but, mm-hmm. um, West Virginia, like when we, cause we drove out here a few times before we moved here and it was just crazy to me how beautiful both West Virginia and, and Virginia are like, I don't think people understand. Everybody's always like, oh, you know, like Colorado or like the South is so beautiful, but like West Virginia and Virginia are beautiful states. So anyway, just random. I'm I'm partial um, that way too. Although North Carolina has some places that are very uh, similar in that aspect too. But if you like mountains and rivers, then West Virginia is a great place. Mm -hmm. I mean, um, so much natural beauty here. Also like fun little things. West Virginia has, I think it's the only natural occurring cranberry bog in the lower 48 states. Interesting. Um, 
I guess you have to have a certain amount of elevation for that. I don't know a lot about that, but um, uh, that, you know, fun things like that. The New River, which is um, really well known for uh, whitewater rafting, um, it goes through here. And, and actually, um, the New River State Park is now the New River National Park. So mm -hmm. it was nice to see that evolution since I've been here. So it really is, it's really um, has a lot of, of beauty and places in Virginia. I mean, there there's a border there, but the mountains don't know the border. Yeah. <laughs> so one question that I, I like to ask people is what are some things that you like to do every day or throughout your life that just make you feel your best? They make you feel your most vibrant. So I have a dog. Um, I've, I've um, pretty much always had a dog, uh, but right now I have a golden retriever. Uh, her name is Gelsey. <laughs> She's named after the ballerina Gelty Kirkland. Yeah, huh. Goldens are such, they're such sweet dogs. And so I, I like to spend some quality time one-on-one -on -one with, with my dog. I just, uh, I don't know. I, for me, there's just something very easygoing. Dogs just want to be around you. They just like mm -hmm. you for you. They're, it's just a, a very <laughs> um, easy uh, relationship there. So th that's definitely something every day I just have some time where it's just her and I, whether I'm petting her, walking her, just hanging. We like to sit out on the patio mm -hmm. <laughs> together. I, I don't go every day, but I like to walk. I, I live uh, near a little park that has some walking trails and I try to get out on, in nature a little bit every day. I like to write every day. Not all, sometimes that leads to things that I'll work on for publication. Sometimes it's just stuff I need to write about, but I try to keep that practice. You know, a dancer goes to class every day and I feel like I brought that, but now I go to the page every day. Mm. So I've also, I've tried to try to always have something new that I'm learning about, whether it's something here on campus that I don't know, or during the pandemic, I, I learned how to cook some new things. But cooking was not something that came naturally to me or that I was super interested in. And then I joined a CSA and so I had all these fresh vegetables. So I was like, well, I can't waste this. I think the thing I was most excited to learn to make was butternut squash soup. Mm. Um, which it's coming up on that, that time of year again. So I'm yep. excited about that. I always try to find something new I can teach myself, even if it's not something that, it, that sticks with me forever or that I'm going to excel at. I feel like uh, learning new things always makes me feel a little more alive in the world. And then probably reading. I mean, I, I read every day. <laughs> it's such a bookworm. Yeah. So those are probably the things and I, I guess also, and this is probably true of a lot of other people, but I'm a, a very much a music listener and all kinds of music. So when the pandemic first hit, it was also the 200, I think it was Beethoven's 250th birthday, but one of the major milestones. So I decided I was going to listen to the full catalog of Beethoven. <laughs> and I started with the symphonies and I worked through the concertos. And by the end of the year, I had listened to them all. And so um, sometimes I, I set those kind of things for myself. But I mean, I love, we have a uh, mountain stage, which is uh, recorded here in, in West Virginia. I always try to listen to their broadcasts. Lately, I've been listening to cover songs. I have a new writing project that connects with why people remake things so and it has been inspired to listen to that um so i mean it really runs the gamut when i was writing fierce and delicate the, the book about dancing i was listening to all the music i used to dance to there's something about listening to swan lake that brings it back in a very very visceral way yeah so those are some things i guess maybe a little all over the map there i love it in true academic fashion you are always learning. I love <laughs> that is true. <laughs> I well, you know, when, when you're at an institution, there's always something interesting happening, right? Sure. So that makes it easy. <laughs> and I want to make sure that listeners don't miss the title of the book. So Fierce and Delicate is the title of your book. And then right. where yes. did you find that? So Fierce and Delicate was published by uh, West Virginia University Press. So you can just go to the press's place online. You can also find it on Amazon, uh, bookshop.org, uh, the places that most people can find books. 
if you're in West Virginia, you can find it at the WVU bookstore. So I got to give a shout out to, to my friends over there. <laughs> <laughs> But yeah, and the, the press has uh, many interesting memoirs that have just come out. So if the answers is your thing, maybe something else would be. So they were wonderful to work with. Really cool to, to do that. Good for you. Congratulations on that. We'll, we'll link it in the show notes as well. So people can thank check. you. So is there anything else that you would like to tell the listeners of the podcast today or something that you want to make sure that they remember after listening to this episode? Wow, that's that's such a good question to ask and such a hard one to answer. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> I guess if if a lot of the listeners are listening, a lot of things in our lives are going to define us. But while some of them, like having an illness, aren't necessarily ones that we can choose, there are so many more that we do choose. Mm-hmm. And so I would say honor those. You have to honor the things that you do for your for your taking care of yourself through illness. But you can honor all those things with the same passion and volition. If there's anybody who's listening that wants to be a writer, they should put pen to paper, I I think, and whatever your passion is. Mm. I think we live in a time where there's so much, you know, you had said, I thought about being an English major. And then people said, what are you going to do with that? Mm -hmm. Maybe just explore first and figure out what we're going to do with it later. I mean, (laughs) don't be shy of your passions, whatever they may be. I think everybody has the right to fulfill those things in their lives that bring them meaning. I mean, what's more important than meaning making? Mm -hmm. I, you know, I don't know. (laughs) I mean, we have all the cares, you know, we have to make a living and all those kinds of things. But I think when we make time for those things, whether they become part of our professional lives or they just enrich our lives in other ways, that you should take them on with all that you have. Mm, I love that. And people, if they want to connect with you, they can connect with you at ReneeNicholson.com. And then your Twitter is SummerBooks1, right? Yep. SummerBooks1. Perfect. I'll have those linked down below. Is there anywhere else that they can find you or are those the best places? Those are probably the two best places. I, I don't do a lot online, but the mm-hmm. things that I do, I try to do well. So yeah. that's a, as a social media manager, that's the best way to do it. Don't spread yourself <laughs> in. It's too much anyway. Well, thank you so much for being here today. We really loved chatting with you and you've given me inspiration to open up that Google doc with my book and, and start restarting it. And yeah. And we really appreciated hearing your story. Yeah. Thank you I, so much. You are a light. I love everything you had to say. I think our listeners will really resonate with a lot of what you said about identity and grit and all yeah. the different parallels with, with the dancing. So I'm really excited for them to hear this and be inspired by your outlook on things and also just your voracious desire. Voracious. That's a very academic word. <laughs> it is. Pretty <laughs> They're really going to also appreciate how you always want to learn and grow. I think that that's a really good reminder because again, we get so stuck symptom chasing and being so hyper vigilant of our physical symptoms that we can kind of just stop growing and living and expanding. And I really feel like you brought that home. So I really appreciated all that you had to say. Well, thank you. You guys are really fun to chat with. Um, I can, you, you put people at ease. So it's, uh, I appreciate that so much. 